David is the founding UK editor-in-chief uh, uh, from Wired. He wrote the book Non-Bullshit Innovation. Did anybody read this book, Non-Bullshit Innovation? Yeah, well, it, it, it is a must-read, because, uh, and he will tell us some stories and also linked to this book, because he has very clear ideas on what he calls pointless innovation theater because that's what he often sees when he travels around the world. And uh, at the other hand, he discovered the exciting and transformative approach to innovations in places where he and we might least expect it. And that is a very interesting approach to see how we can have this approach to, uh, to um, innovation. Um, he participated as advisor and investor in, uh, in total 160 startups. Among them, there are two Dutch, in climate tech, so he will tell us some more about this. So I'm going to give you the floor for a full inspiration given by David Rowan. Give him a warm hand of applause. Great to have you, David. Welcome. Welcome. I will give you a glass of water. The floor is yours. Hello. Nice to be here. Excuse me if I speak English. My Dutch isn't so good. Um, so we're talking quite a lot about tech disrupting traditional companies, creating new markets. I know what it feels like from the other side. I've been disrupted. I wrote a book. Penguin asked me to go and record the audiobook version, so I spent three days in a windowless studio in West London getting a sore throat, but I did it, and then I realized there was an AI startup that could have done it in 10 minutes. Imagine turning your book into an audiobook in just 10 minutes. Now you can using audiobook.ai for 10 times less than paying a voice talent. All you have to do is upload your book to audiobook.ai, select a voice from over 30 natural sounding oh, voices, well, of course, this and in is 10 not minutes human. you can this download your audiobook. Voice. And the voices so sound just like me. We're at that moment where what? I'm a tech is moving voice on so fast. AI. It Try can now. make us feel like it's out of control. This morning, this video going viral, showing a self-driving car being pulled over by police in San Francisco. This is crazy. The car was pulled over because it was driving at night without headlights on. An officer gets out of his car to speak to the driver, only to discover... Ain't nobody in it. And then the car speeds away from the officers, passing through an intersection. Because the AI knows it's safer the other side of the red light. So, before pulling over Just again. as I'm getting used to what I thought was the future, you know, stuff like the metaverse was nonsense. Zuckerberg had bet on the wrong horse. I'm having to constantly revise my thinking because improvements in tech get better and better. A couple of weeks ago, we learned that the metaverse actually could be quite useful. Um, Zuck gave an interview to Lex Friedman, a podcaster in the metaverse, but now wearing the headphones, even if you're hundreds of miles away, creates the sense that you're actually present. I'm already forgetting that you're not real. <laughs> like this really, so it's, well, I am it's novel. It's a, this is just a, uh, an avatar that's, version of me. But, that's a but, but deep philosophical question, yes. So it makes but, it but here's kind of dangerous to dismiss a technology I was like, all right, when it keeps like, improving it's on like, that okay, so this, exponential curve. My hair is a little shorter curve. in this than my physical and hair is right now. And all our assumptions hair. about um, how we I, interact with the I network, did you know, forget the mouse, morning, but, but forget the touch screen. You know, I could still have this Last week, avatar that is, a very well-funded group of former right, Apple people thought it might be the in. smart AI pin. Uh, this is a company called Humane that is experimenting. It might not make it, but there's a lot of creative experimentation. You know, does projecting onto your hand maybe create the next generation of interfaces. But there's only one theme that everybody's talking about at the moment. This has been a crazy year for one technology. I'm not going to give too much away, but the Google boss, Sundar Pichai, gave a very long presentation to the Google Developers Conference in May. Um, I'm not going to make you sit through the whole hour. Here's 14 seconds. See if you can work out his subtle message. AI, 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 generative AI, generative AI, generative AI, 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 A
So I'm really quite old, and I remember 1994 when I was an editor at The Guardian, and I went into a cyber cafe, because that was the only place you could get online in central London, and I played with this, which was the first proper web browser. It's called Mosaic, and the next year it became Netscape. And it was terrible. It was super slow. You had to wait for it to dial up. It was just text. There were no images. This was the internet. This was Yahoo's homepage then. It was hand-edited, and there were hardly any websites there. But I had a sense then that, yeah, we'll solve the bandwidth. We'll allow images. At some stage, we'll even have moving images. What's this going to do? It's going to mean, as a journalist, I can get any information from anywhere in the world. If I'm wanting to buy something, I could transact. What about entertainment? And I kind of knew, for me, that was the Netscape moment, that we were just at the very start. And it wasn't going to happen overnight. But it was, over time, going to create massive opportunities for disrupting all sorts of industries. And then I got the good fortune to um, set up, run a magazine that tries to understand the future from the people building it, not just tech and science, design, architecture, culture. And I was trying all, all the time to work out what was next. And there was one hack I realized, which comes down to this picture from 1956 of five megs of storage being uploaded to the cloud which is now just one picture on your iPhone. And I think what I learned is follow the exponential curves. That Moore's Law idea that stuff seems expensive, seems scarce, but over time, the doubling and doubling, the halving and halving, things will come down to pretty much free. Look out for those exponential curves. The steepest exponential curve I've ever seen, and I collect these things, is the ability of the machine to perform cognitive tasks as well as humans. And if you look at you know, the yellow curve image recognition in the last decade, we've gone crazy. We can generate code now using a generative AI. So it started slowly, you know, recognizing handwriting, but every area where the machine can think we're heading upwards on that inflection. And there was something very wise that Kevin Kelly, the first editor of US Wired, wrote nine years ago. So he'd been there at the beginning of the internet, the World Wide Web, the ability to register domains. Initially, it didn't cost any money. In 1994, he and a couple of colleagues at Wired registered a few domains that were just available, mcdonalds.com. And they called McDonald's and said, hey, we've got this website. We'll give it to you. And McDonald's said, well, why would we want it? No thanks. They couldn't see ahead. They couldn't imagine a scenario where business might depend on digital ordering, digital marketing, digital customer discovery. And nine years ago, he wrote a little essay called You Are Not Too Late. It was 2014, and his premise was, we think everything significant on the internet has already been invented. Transaction, entertainment, commerce. But he said, actually, we're going to look back in 2044 and realize there were some extraordinary opportunities, some extraordinary trillion-dollar companies built after 2014, because we were just starting to put sensors out into the wild. We were just starting to calculate data at scale. And if you think about where we are today, we're just at the beginning. We haven't put intelligence into almost everything, but the tools are there, and the access point is coming down to a zero price point. And if you think about every exponential technology, from quantum computing 
to the potential for new sources of energy like nuclear fusion, to the way we're able to create new materials at scale. We're just at the beginning. So I'm going to dedicate this to Kevin and to remind us all, you are not too late. Because I think the last decade has, has been connecting everything to the net. But now it's putting intelligence into everything. And we haven't really started thinking about what that means. But when performance keeps doubling and doubling, and price keeps halving and halving, it really is limited only by our creative entrepreneurial imagination, how we can go and disrupt. So think about what's happening in robotics. It's no longer just the car factory. It's now consumer robotics in all sorts of settings. This is how your hotel will soon be cleaned. A tech invented for one purpose becomes a commodity, is used for all sorts of other things. The robot dog wasn't invented to enforce lockdown in Shanghai during the pandemic, but it's out there. Anybody can use it. Drones are not simply war weapons, the ability to take better photos. This is a company called Tevel that's using drones with com computer vision that recognizes which apples are ripe and then it can pick them. You know, it's already happening on the roads. This is in China. The tech is everywhere, but regulatory regimes create different opportunities for entrepreneurs. And this is where it's going next. You know, we are about to get the flying car. There's a company called Volocopter that's got a contract to take people in vertical takeoff electric jets in the Paris Olympics next year, so things go mainstream. But what everybody's been talking about clearly over the last few months is this doubling and doubling of generative AI and what it's able to do. And what it's able to do is quite crazy. If you've been playing with some of these tools, like Runway, like Midjourney, inventing your own movie without having actors there, this is what Runway enables. And this is in everybody's hands now. This is commodified. If you are a Hollywood studio, if you are an advertising agency spending hundreds of thousands of euros on a 30-second shoot, this changes the rules. You need to keep up. It's an opportunity for startups. And look how quickly, because of those curves, we've got here. Early 2021, this company, which was a non-profit non then, called OpenAI, created the ability with Dali for you to type in a text prompt in a box. And it was fun, but it wasn't life changing. You know, Runway started about 18 months ago with the ability to customize an image. It had a big database of video. It's predictive in its algorithm, but it's pretty compelling. But we've jumped so far ahead now that these tools are in everybody's hands. This video is generated by AI. The AI avatar is generated by Midjourney. Script is generated by ChatGPT. Text to audio is done by Eleven Labs. And finally, image to video conversion is done by DID AI. Do you want to create video so like this? If you Let are me show you the process step a law step. firm, Go to if you're a manufacturing com. company, Click if you're a media company trial. and you're not playing with this create tech, you're going to get left behind. Click it's not perfect yet. Video. Sometimes typing in you a text prompt doesn't deliver avatar. the results you're hoping for. Available. Typing in well, you can salmon swimming upstream avatar. may get you something <laughs> like this, but we're on the way. And it's indistinguishable from magic because it's an advanced technology that's increasingly working. What about a tech that you can just speak to there's an app called Replit that will make an app for you. These people wanted a workout app. They talk to Replit. In seconds, it does the coding. And already this year, we've had a bunch of products hit the market that 
generate, edit, TikToks, music, code. So we worry quite a lot about what it means for us. million full-time jobs around the world could be affected by artificial intelligence. In a report Sunday, their economists predicted 18% of work globally could be computerized. Although at the same time, Goldman Sachs is getting rid of its coders because it's using AI. We've been a bit scared about AI taking our jobs. It seems the only job that's gone so far is the guy running the AI, but maybe he'll get it back. Who knows? So there are social, political, economic consequences of all this. We do need to think about those that will get left behind. You know, what's the role of the regulator? What's the role of the state? How do we stop income disparity growing? But it's not going to slow down. And it's not just going to be about AI. It's going to be about what happens when AI is enhanced by quantum computing. What happens when there's a few companies controlling access to all this data processing. What happens when we access the network in all sorts of new ways? So the neural interface is already here, the brain-computer interface. One of Elon's projects called Neuralink, this monkey has a brain implant that's reading electrical signals in the brain. The monkey is playing pong but not using hands. This tech is out there. It's got other uses at the same time. This gentleman in a University of San Francisco study can't speak, can't move his arms, but it reads the words he's trying to say. I met this gentleman, Nathan to Copeland. He had a car accident I and became paralyzed. The move There's an American company called BlackRock Neuro that's put a, an implant that reads his thoughts so he can play games. He can do art on the screen. So at, this uh, is a crazy sci-fi idea. Them. Those it's just becoming an everyday technology over the next X years. Uh, and I'm not saying we'll all be wearing brain implants, but so it would be foolish to assume that the way we will access entertainment is by touching to a little glass click. screen. Maybe we'll be wearing some kind of device because we're getting better at reading those cortex. signals. So if you're a startup, if you're supporting startups, if you're an incumbent trying to stay alive, you've got to look for the next curves. And they're everywhere. This is a logarithmic scale, the falling cost of sequencing DNA, the green falling much more steeply than the straight line of Moore's law. What was $100 million at the beginning of the century to sequence a person is now $10, $20. It changes healthcare fundamentally. You can sequence the tumor as well as the patient. Another logarithmic scale, the falling cost of solar energy. At the beginning, you needed heavy government subsidies. Now, the market takes over. Linked to that is one of our biggest economic opportunities, I think, of our lifetime. The transition to low carbon. This is the amount of money going in to climate tech you know, a nice exponential curve. It forces every organization in every sector to transform. So every time you see an exponential curve, it's not about here. It's about being prepared for here. This, in the orange, is the total value of cryptocurrencies in circulation. The blue line is the total value of US dollars in circulation. In 2021, crypto overtook dollars. If you're a central bank, if you're a government, if you're an investor, you can ignore it for a while, but it's dangerous to ignore it here because that doubling and doubling at some stage heads towards vertical. It's like that Hemingway line in the sun also rises. Two guys in a bar, one says he's just gone bankrupt. The other says, how did you go bankrupt? He says, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. That's what's happening in every form of tech. 
So whenever you see an exponential curve, massive opportunities. This one is the total number of space launches over the last few years. Look what's happened. Reusable rockets, low-cost launches. It now doesn't cost millions to launch a satellite. It costs a few thousand. Changes the nature of internet access because you can have constellations of satellites. You can now perform experiments, scientific experiments in space in zero gravity at low cost. It's going to change all sorts of material science, drug discovery. Although you do want to be on a SpaceX off-site when they're using their reusable rockets. If your team off-site doesn't have cheering like this, you've got to work harder. So, you know, everywhere we look, there are tech opportunities. This is a McKinsey slide, but it doesn't teach you anything you don't know. You know, the biology revolution, the nanomaterials revolution. Software, security software, programming. And yet we're humans. The AI hasn't fundamentally changed some of the difficult aspects of being human, which is we're uncomfortable with rapid change. We're also in organizations, typically, which are rewarding continuity. If you made money a certain way the last quarter, the quarter before that, it's really hard to say, screw that, we're going to do something radically different. We're going to disrupt ourselves. It's easy to keep on doing the old way for a bit, but eventually gravity will catch up. Which is what kind of obsessed me about proper innovation, because I got to talk at a lot of corporate innovation off-sites, and they had their head of innovation and their startups in their incubator. And you'd say, how has this changed the culture? How has this changed how you operate? And very, very little ever changed. It was more signaling change. But now there's an urgency. I'm, in particular, thinking about the planetary urgency that's affecting because the regulators, especially in Europe, are pushing for change. Every single company having to be carbon accountable, having to come up with new strategies. You are not too late in reinventing any business as a carbon accountable business. We're still putting 162 million tons into it every single day. And the accumulated amount is now trapping as much extra heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every single day on the Earth. That's what's boiling the oceans, creating these atmospheric rivers and the rain bombs. And I think what's and really interesting the about the land and this room the droughts and melting the ice is the Netherlands the has some superpowers in addressing this issue. You know, the Netherlands has special knowledge and experience in rethinking agriculture, in understanding you know, how to get that balance between rising sea and land, in regenerative energy. It's an unfair advantage you have. Use it. This is the moment. One of the things I'm doing now is bringing people together in climate tech to try and create connections. I've created a kind of not-for-profit community called Voyagers. We do dinners. We had a dinner here last night with some entrepreneurs, um, trips. And it's really interesting what people are working on in the community. There's no limit to the ambition. So just inside our climate tech network, it's essentially peer support, people helping each other. There's a bunch of people working on nuclear fusion. Super ambitious for startups. They might need to raise a couple of billion, but they're doing it. They're working on carbon negative building materials. They're working on zero emission hydrogen electric aviation. They're working on packaging material made from seaweed that you can then eat. We invested in a couple of 
local companies. One, a guy who hates agriculture, he created a company called Farmless to turn air into protein for food. There's another one called EV Bio that's using precision fermentation to create new materials. There's a lot of great research here. It's just thinking boldly about it. And every problem is an opportunity. So RFID tags that you see in every item of clothing in Uniqlo, they're not recyclable. They have plastic and metal embedded. And then I met this company called Coprint that creates a copper nano ink that allows you to print conductive labels so you don't need QR codes. It's like creativity with the science. And I think what's really exciting at the moment is there is a move of talent going from conventional sectors into solving these climate issues. They're the climate quitters. There are people leaving McKinsey and Goldman Sachs and Google to try and solve a real problem. And I think where you can add profit to purpose, you create a really quite exciting opportunity for which you are not too late. Um, so this is a writer called George Serafim who wrote an interesting book about it. Um, and he's a business school professor. He wants businesses to make money, but he's noticed that you get highly motivated teams if you're working on something with a greater purpose than making money. And also, it can be fun to you know, create a shoe company with a new kind of business model, buy one, give one to a good cause. You attract customers' loyalty. Or if you're an energy company and you know you need to reinvent yourself, so you decide to become you know, the best in your field and investing in alternatives, you can be dominant. Or if you're a big sausage meat company, you can think, what is our superpower? We know how to manufacture, we know how to distribute, we know food, but the market is going in a different direction. What if we become super dominant, reinvent our systems, our assumptions in non-meat food? And just think every sector is not just being digitized, it's having intelligence added, but also it's attracting talent that is helping think in new ways. You know, the planet itself, there's a bunch of new kinds of companies creating data, measuring di biodiversity, quantifying sustainability in new ways. There are huge markets being created here. Think about where we are with old school education, which was great for the Industrial Revolution, passing information passively to the student. But what happens when you can personalize the education for each of the 30 students in the room? Because you know through smart data feedback what they're good at, what they're not so good at. There's all sorts of companies in India, in China, that are doing this in a personalized way. What's happening in healthcare? We're still at the very beginning. We're not tracking very much of our data. Some of you may be wearing an aura ring or a continuous glucose monitor to monitor your body's effect of various foods. But this is just the beginning. You know, we've now got lots of low-cost regulated products, the butterfly ultrasound reader that you can plug into your phone, clinical grade ultrasound, so good that the chief medical officer was playing with it and discovered something he didn't want to discover. Rather personal story, but the butterfly ultrasound device that we use today, I diagnosed my own tumor with it. I felt something funny in my neck, connected the probe to my phone, did an ultrasound, and there it was. My so we're just at the beginning. What's happening in connecting us to what we want? Once the light turns green, I will turn around. So the world is going autonomous. You know, the roads already have these trucks that are safer than humans. The humans are the ones in the way because they say we're not convinced that these are fit to be regulated yet. But they're there. 
One thing I learned whilst writing my book, which took me to about 20 countries, looking, because I didn't want to be cynical, looking for positive instances of existing incumbent organizations actually transforming themselves, creating future-facing business models using tech, which essentially is what innovation is. Um, there are some hacks. There are some hacks which will work not just for the big incumbents, but for the small teams building. Um, and I'll share a few things, because nobody reads books. I am happy to accept that. So in, in about four minutes, I'm going to tell you everything you would have learned whilst reading the book. Um, and some, some little heuristics, some little hacks. And one of the hacks, this is the most incumbent organization you've ever seen. This is like the world's biggest office building in Washington, D.C., with three million people working for the U.S. Department of Defense. Massive bureaucracy. They knew that they weren't going to move fast enough. They knew that ISIS was thinking like a startup. The U.S. comes up with a procurement project. It comes in years overdue, billions over budget, and is not fit for purpose, because the enemy, ISIS, can take a DJI drone, put a grenade on it, send it over the line. It's a startup. It can break the rules. Their solution, we have to hire some pirates. We have to have some people inside the organization with permission to just build, with permission not to follow the rules, with permission to solve a problem as best they can. So the Department of Defense hired a guy from startups who swears all the time, hates authority, wears hoodies that say things like hack the Pentagon. He was jailed at 16 at school for planting a fake bomb because he didn't like school. His name's Chris Lynch from startups, not from military. And they said, we need to move faster. We need some of that startup energy. Build a team of 20 or 30 people from the world of coding, from the world of interaction design, who can just build. They did the first ever bug bounty contest in American government. They were told it was illegal. You can't encourage friendly hackers to penetrate Department of Defense websites. They found a loophole. They did it. Vulnerabilities were found within minutes. It's now government policy across US government departments. They went to the front line in Iraq where ISIS was using drones to drop grenades. They coded with the local soldiers a radio signal jammer that took the drones out of the sky that saved lives. So they would have got killed by the culture, but he had a letter in his pocket from the Secretary of Defense saying, these people are on a mission, get out of their way. Every time they were blocked, that was protecting them. So you need, inside your organization, the ability of a small team just to move. Their official title in that department was Defense Digital Service, but they called themselves the Rebel Alliance. It's even on their door in the Pentagon because they were like that Star Wars counterculture. I think you also need to experiment, but go back to why you exist. So I went to Finland where the biggest consumer retail bank called Op was being disrupted by startups. Foreign currency transactions, transfer-wise, was doing better. Insurance, lots of startups were doing better. A third of their revenue was from lending money for people to buy cars. What if we don't buy cars in the future, we just access the autonomous network of electric cars? And they realized they had to work out how to survive. What did they have? And it's a 100-year-old bank owned by the customers. And they went back to first principles why are we here? What's our unfair advantage? We are here to help the people of Finland get through difficult life transitions, buy their first tractor for the farm 100 years ago, buy their first mortgage. Where is the market failing? Or how about keep them healthy? So the bank builds five hospitals and operates on people. So the bank performing surgery, super efficient new hospitals, but because they start from scratch, they get rid of a lot of the inefficiencies. They create a health insurance project, product next to it, which because the hospitals are super efficient, is quite low cost, becomes the fastest growing health insurance business in the Nordics. It's 
weird that a bank is repairing people's broken limbs, but it's finding something that is true to their purpose that the market is not doing. So one of the other things I noticed in a lot of the companies that were really innovating was they didn't make decisions at the top, they allowed everybody as much freedom as possible to make decisions. This is the head of the most successful games company in Europe, Supercell, Ilka Panan, and you've played his games. He talks about wanting to be the world's least powerful CEO. He wants to hire amazing people and then just let them work, let them do their thing. The teams decide when they kill a project. They don't need his permission. But it works, because it's all about talent. This guy had a talent. His name was Eric Yuan. He came from China, tried about 18 times to get a visa to work in the States, finally got a visa, got a job at an early web conferencing company called um, WebEx, and notoriously bad software. Calls kept cutting off, lagging. Eric and his team were embarrassed by the customer feedback. They kept going to the bosses, say, could we just have a bit of investment to make it better? Sorry, not a corporate priority. WebEx is then bought by Cisco. He thinks we'll have some more money. Could we have an investment? Sorry, not a corporate priority. Frustrated, he and his team leave and build another business which becomes Zoom, which about two years ago almost overtook the market cap of Cisco because they were motivated. One other thing I'd noticed is find ways for smart people who think differently to run into each other. At Google X, the moonshot part of Google, where they come up with all sorts of crazy businesses, they're obsessed with what they call cognitive diversity. They won't have a team just with engineers and designers and science people. They also have to put in you know, the origami expert, the former concert pianist, because coming from different cognitive mindsets, they challenge each other. And you need to find ways for different types of thinking to come together, even if it means the design of your workplace. So these are the Nobel Prize winners for medicine for coming up with the RNA, the mRNA vaccine. They met in a line for the photocopier at the University of Pennsylvania. They wouldn't have otherwise met, and they started talking about their research. So can you find ways to bring different types of people together for random, spontaneous, serendipitous conversation? This is the biggest biomedical research center in Europe in London next to St. Pancras called the Crick Institute, trying to solve cancer and genomic illness. They've designed it with no walls on the inside because it's not going to be the lone scientist shouting Eureka in a lab. It's going to be the bioinformatics expert having a conversation with the data scientist, bringing in the genomics expert. That's how you're going to solve cancer. I'll just give you a couple more quick ones and then I'm happy to take lots of questions. How does a software company that made it 30, 40 years ago with design software that you buy in a box, how do they survive in an era where you don't buy software, you subscribe to it, where you don't buy it in a box where it's streamed? So Autodesk have stayed relevant by having a chunk of their revenue for play. They've invested in things like a pier in San Francisco full of 3D printers and robots and artists on paid fellowships, and anybody can come from the company and play. And so it's having revenue spent, but with no pressure to bring in revenue, to look for your blind spots. They keep experimenting. One thing they were doing is, what if we get, this is eight or nine years ago, AI working with designers to provide alternatives as they're building. They called it generative design. This is years before we were talking about generative AI. They worked out it changes the experience. It's now in all sorts of products as a massive moat. It's a billion dollar moat. And I guess the last couple of thoughts, you won't do this yourself, build an ecosystem. This is Lei Jun of Xiaomi 
one of the most successful handset companies in China. They make no margin on the handsets. Instead, they've built an ecosystem, as they call it, investing in hundreds of accessory startups. The best-selling air purifier in China, made by a startup but with their brand on. The best-selling battery pack in China, made by a startup but with their brand on. They make no money from the handsets, but a nice share of the revenue. But also, it gets the customers coming back. It's what they call their ecosystem approach. It's differentiated them. We put him on the cover of Wired saying it's time to copy China. So I'm going to leave you with this idea of culture as the key determinant, not so much about tech, of who's going to win the next round of innovation. Don't just talk to people who talk about the stuff you talk about. You know, go to that crypto event, go to that human rights event, because tech is everywhere. It's just how we choose to apply it. You're not going to stop a tech, even if you invent it. Stephen Sasson invented the digital camera in 1975. Unfortunately, his employer, called Kodak, tried to suppress it because it wasn't convenient to their business model. It doesn't work like that, and we all know what happens if you get too comfortable. I think I'll leave you with, in an era where we're worrying about what happens to the human as the AI expands. One of the problems with being a human is we're biased. We're scared of change. That time you are in the completely autonomous car for the first time, it's going to be a bit, like, uncomfortable. Oh, there's cars coming! Oh! Oh, there's cars! Bill, this... Put me back for me control it. Oh, but you know, Jesus. in a I couple of weeks, never. it's just going to be another way for her to go and play bridge oh, with her friends. Thank you for listening. David. Thank you so very much, David Brown. Now, this was an inspiring thought on how it is not too late and that we should emphasize more on culture and that that's all, well, very often a little bit forgotten. Maybe we have some time for some, to take some questions. I'm sure that there is anybody sure? I'm, I'm, yes, I have somebody here, and one of the colleagues will come to you with a microphone, and please Still tell humans, us who you delivering are. delivering mics, not, not drones. This is good. Yes, this is good. <laughs> tell us who you are. Uh, yeah, my name is PJ. Um, I was wondering, I have a lot of questions, but I'll just hand the mic off to the next yeah. one uh -huh. after the first. Um, you are aware that OpenAI was created as a um, foundation to offer the benefits of the language model to everybody, to all of mankind. Um, looking at the situation the last three days, what's your take on this? Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny. Um, Tech changes business models, so we've got Uber as a mobility company that owns no cars. We've got Airbnb as a hospitality company that owns no rooms. We've got OpenAI as a company that has no staff, because they've all pretty much quit. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, I mean, capitalism can be beautiful but it does tend to change the motivations of people trying to do something for you know, progress, for humanity's benefit. And there was, from the start, a tension in that project between those who just wanted to build responsible AI and those who saw it as a massive business opportunity that could head towards monopoly. Mm. And you don't raise billions from Microsoft as philanthropy. It's because they wanted to put a moat between themselves and their competitors. And I think these tensions sometimes cause explosions, if they, as they have in the past few days. What I worry about, I don't worry about, in the short term, the AI going to kill humanity by turning us all into paper clips. Um, I do worry about a small number of monopoly tech bros 
making the decisions that the rest of us should have a say in. Because the, the speed of development of these technologies is going to have a massive impact on the economy, on society, on people's earning abilities. And we haven't had that proper conversation. We haven't worked out what the role of the state is. Should there be a universal basic income? How do we transform education to give people the skills of the future? And do we want just a small number of people to be at the top of this pyramid with income disparity growing? Now tell me, is it too late for this discussion? This is the moment that we all need to get active. We all need to inform ourselves. We need our leaders, our politicians, our regulators to know what we think. But I think if we don't have the conversation now, this is going to be half a dozen people deciding, essentially, as in 1945, you know, there's this amazing new technology. It could be used for energy generation or <laughs> eradicating humanity. Let's get together and work out what non-proliferation looks like. We haven't had that here. Okay, so a warm plea for that conversation soon. Another question. Ta -da. Yes, in the back. Hi, I'll stand up. I'm Jochem. Um, you mentioned in the start of your uh, uh, presentation uh, to look out for exponential curves. Uh, of course, we're not too late with innovation and technology, but for some things you are too late. Uh, many cryptos are an example of this. Um, you've invested in more than 60 startups. 160, actually. 160. Yeah. It's a, I, I have a high tolerance of pain. Okay. <laughs> I, I imagine mm. that helps. Um, but what do you look for uh, in a trend to discover that it's exponential before you have the historical data to show it as being so? Oh, gosh, good question. You can, so there's a few things that I look for. Mostly it's the humans involved, um, because it comes down to founders and what's really motivating them and their determination to solve a problem, their unfair advantage in addressing that problem, their resilience, and so on. Um, but in general, and I'm still learning how to do this, in general, the investors I respect look for what's likely to be a growth market that's still at the early stage, but there's already some evidence of demand. So you can start to see those curves. You've just got to try and understand what the reason is for the continuing rise. And with quantum, there's lots of... Um, successful early research that says we're likely to be able to perform quantum computing in a shorter time scale than we've been led to believe. And that's going to change um, you know, drug discovery. It's going to be a challenge for banks because their RSA encryption is going to be broken. So already the bad guys are stealing your personal data, even if it's encrypted, knowing that in a couple of years they'll be able to Store now the crypt later. That, uh, yeah. um, and there are lots of sectors where this is starting to happen. Um, nuclear fusion, which could kind of solve all the other energy problems, <laughs> which has always been 20, 30 years away, famously, um, actually looks like there's progress. So this would not be a bad time to start a fund dedicated towards nuclear fusion. You don't know which ones are going to win, but as a sector, we seem to be solving these mm -hmm. problems. I'm mostly, um, apart from climate, excited about what's likely to happen in healthcare because we have barely started to capture data from this thing. And instead, the whole economic model has been on fixing the person when broken. Why shouldn't we be tracking what's happening inside your blood, what um, behavioral traits, just through how your voice is changing, to keep people healthy. Yeah. Wow, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, coffee is waiting for us. I have a
quick chat with Mark on stage, but then we will have coffee all together. David will be for a little moment uh, with us during coffee. So uh, then make sure that you have your qu questions uh, asked. Thank you so very, Thank very you. much for having been here and with us today. And climate tech people, tell me what you're building especially, because I'm deep in that sector and I see that as a huge growth area. Anyway. Maybe you can just give, that's maybe interesting as a, as a final, really, uh, because you are involved uh, also in Dutch startups in this domain. Can you give us some words to that? Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Don't uh, solve the little problems. Go for the big ones. You know, reinvent the food system, reinvent building materials. This is the biggest opportunity see. in our lifetime, because thank you Brussels, any company in the world that wants to trade in Europe is going to have to meet those increasingly tight compliance yes. standards, yeah. which means we're going to have to create massive new companies, probably in Europe, that create this new transportation, create these new energy storage systems. And, you know, there's people in the room here who could be building what become trillion dollar companies. Redefine, rethink. Thank you very much. Thank you. David Rowan, thank you. Thank you so much.